Well, we've just finished the most amazing interview with Dr. Naomi Murphy. I think it's probably the best we've done in terms of hearing about how things operate in prisons and what you can do with seriously dangerous men if you actually make a real effort and you uh, have a process that, um, in fact, she's using. And to some extent, it ties in with a lot of other interviews we've done to do with what's happening to men um, through their lives, um, both from early childhood, um, through the family court, through education. Yeah. So it's a, it's a very interesting talk. She's um, a consultant clinical and forensic psychologist. She's the clinical director of the FENS, Offender Personality Disorder <coughs> Pathway Service, which is based in the High Secure Prison HMP Whitemore. And she's been working there with offenders, I think, for more than 20 years and heading up that service. And what a brilliant woman she is. Naomi, you've um, created this program, which is um, the FEN program, and it's been used at the Whitemore uh, Prison. Tell us, tell us really how that started and, and what's developed, because you've been doing it for a long time now, I think. Yeah, sure. Thanks, thanks, Jill. It arose from on the back of the Fallon inquiry into Ashworth Hospital, uh, and uh, Lord Fallon identified that there were a number of people in hospitals and prisons that were um, diagnosed as personality disordered that were then precluded from having any treatment or they, they weren't able to get to grips with treatment. So on the back of the Ashworth inquiry, they set up, he recommended that they actually set up hybrid services managing using great skills from health as well as great skills from the prison service thinking that neither service could really do justice to this population um, but I guess to save money they decided to establish two in hospital and two in prison and so the FENS was the first of these programs um, so they were, it was, had the horrible title of dangerous and severe personality disorder mm. project which a horrible label which I totally understand people reacting to but there was also a lot of adverse publicity at the time with people being very frightened that this was going to amount to warehousing of people in reality in prison what it meant was that there were a large group of people who were who were prevented from doing any treatment in prison because they were seen as bit their psychopathy scores were seen as being too high and the belief was that if they did standard prison offending behaviour programmes, the treatment would make them worse. Or they'd tried treatment programmes and they'd, they'd been checked off them for being too disruptive and difficult to manage. Mm. Or they'd got to the end of treatment and people felt that, well, actually nothing had changed. So there are a lot of men that were stuck in the, in the English prison system who had no way of going forward. So they opened it at Whitemore Prison um, because they happened to have an empty prison wing because they couldn't get enough staff to um, to run it as a normal prison wing, which, you know, with hindsight, it seems ludicrous that a population that pe mental health professionals generally don't don't like to work with people with personality disorder or who'd meet a diagnosis of personality disorder, they're seen as being too difficult. I think really because there's a lot of mistrust amongst this population, so they reject efforts mm. to help them mm. um, and that makes people, staff feel quite inadequate um, so they decided to put some of the most dangerous some of the most difficult and dangerous prisoners in the country in this service and then have to recruit staff to work in it which so it's always been a problem to get to get staff but so when can the I, unit can first I just, opened in 2000 can yeah. I just in, I just wanted to inter interpose because you're mentioning psychiatrists not wanting to treat <laughs> people with personalities as a psychiatrist, and I mean, there there are two things I just wanted to kind of just pick up. One was I think the concern, one of the concerns that lay people had, or certainly psychiatrists who weren't in the forensic world had, was that people were going to be sent to prison who hadn't actually committed an offence yes. that justified a prison sentence because nobody wanted, nobody knew what to do with them. They were fearful that they would do something very dangerous. They hadn't necessarily actually done anything, so they were being convicted in the absence of actual offence and that was and, and that they might st spend the rest of their lives in prison even though they hadn't done anything really which might even necessarily require imprisonment they were just thought that they were going to so that was one of the concerns and the other thing I if, I mean I'm chipping in a bit too much here but the other thing was that personality disorder sits in an awkward place as far as mental illness is concerned because 
it's not really a mental illness. It's it doesn't come into the category like schizophrenia or bipolar disorder or severe depression. Um, it it it's a cat. It's a label that's attached to people whose behaviour falls outside what's socially acceptable, and it causes suffering. But it's not easily, philosophically at least, defined as an illness. So I think there was a lot of there's a lot of resistance amongst psychiatrists to the idea that you call it an illness and treat it as an illness, even though quite clearly somebody's got to do something about it. So anyway, I'm, I'm just chipping in there just to, I suppose, balance that forensic perspective, um, if I might. Sorry. <laughs> No, absolutely, absolutely, and I think I think that's right. I think the the opposition was very much about a fear of of there might be abuses of human rights. Yes, um, but the reality was, in terms of the men that came to our service, you had to have already committed a very serious exactly and that's what you're explaining is that they were in the prison system already they were already in the prison system most of them were serving life sentences for um quite often they'd had a very extensive history of violent offending anyway and they were risk assessed as they had to be risk assessed as being at risk of committing a further serious offence. So these were people who were stuck in prison anyway. Some of them were, I remember when I first started there, some of them were like 20 years over tariff. So they hadn't, you know, they were still on category A, they'd not made any progress at all and were really, were really stuck. So actually the service like ours offered hope to these, to these Yes, and otherwise uh, they've got got nothing to lose, have they? Uh, yeah, definitely. And many of them had come from conditions of long term segregation or living in the close supervision environments. We have had a number of men who've committed very serious offences whilst in prison, such as killing in prison. Um, so these were people that really were presenting the prison service with a problem in terms of how, A, how do they manage them, but also how do they help these men make progress, reduce their um, dangerousness and managed to live on normal location because they weren't on normal location and yet um, the FENS unit is a, it's effectively a normal prison wing that's been adapted um, to create some therapy rooms but it just looks like a normal prison wing um, when you come to yeah. it. Mm. So, so did they come um, willingly Naomi? Did the, because of what you said, did they come willingly to, to treatment? Well, I wasn't there for the first three years. Um, during that time, they just seconded in because they couldn't they couldn't recruit clinical staff to work there. Um, apart from a fantastic psychiatrist, actually, who worked there for about 15, 15 years, Dr. Val Hawes, who was amazing. Um, but the men, we, we you couldn't come, you couldn't be, you can't force anyone to have treatment in prison. So the men had to volunteer, mm-hmm. but the vast majority would say it was Hobson's choice. You know, they were stuck. Right. Um, the, they weren't going anywhere. The parole board, there was no options identified for them. So really they had to come to us because it was kind of like last chance saloon, if you like. Um, I think as things have changed over time, men have been much more willing, they've heard good things and been much more willing to yeah. come to us much earlier on in their sentence. But the first men who came were, the majority were well over tariff, stuck in the system, stuck in really unpleasant conditions because they, they're they in segregation for so long, for instance. And by well over tariff, you mean... long-term healthcare. By well over tariff, you mean they've, they've been stayed in prison long after their sentence was over? Or what? What does that mean? Um, well, when... when Yes, that's, that's a good question. Actually, take you kind of um, take the jargon for granted when you're immersed in the system. But when people are given a life sentence, they're given a, a minimum amount of time that they have to serve before they can be considered for release. So that's their tariff. Right. And then af- after that date, they have to show that they've reduced their risk adequately to pr- to progress forward. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I would say the crimes that the men within our service have committed were often often had quite unusual or bizarre features. So they had more often attacked people that they had no relationship to previously. Whereas I suppose most people who are serving life sentences in prison have have attacked somebody they know. Mm. And there were often unusual features like they perhaps had dismembered the body. Um, So the crimes could appear quite bizarre 
at times. So they'd often had very lengthy tariffs um, beyond um, what might be kind of like an average tariff for a, for a murder, for instance. So they'd already been, in, you know, had a 20 year tariff, sometimes more, and then served a lot longer than that on top of that. So mm. the, the first population were really quite a lot of quite old men, actually. Yeah, um, I was thinking in their of that. 50s and 60s. Mm. With with the thought that they're never going to get out, presumably, or the worry that they they're not going to get out, ever. Absolutely, yeah. yeah, 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 very much so. So our service and the subsequent one that opened at Franklin Westgate really offered hope for this population. And so I understand the concerns of warehousing, um, but actually it was quite frustrating to hear these concerns being, that got a lot of media attention, that argument. Um, but the reality was it was it was intended for men who were already in prison, who were already stuck, who was already presenting a problem. And I think personally, I would argue it offered them a much more humane, hopeful pathway forward than they'd experienced. Mm. And I suppose a lot of the a lot of the population, though, uh, Naomi, would be thinking, well, goodness me, shouldn't they be locked up for life and just forget about them? Because that seems to be the way people think, isn't it? It, it does. I mean, I know, it, you know, my heart sinks whenever they kind of yeah. like publish figures of what proportion of the population would like to bring back the death penalty. But I think when people see um, more into the lives of people who've committed offences um, or have more of an insight into what happens in prison I think there tends to be a little bit more compassion then so I think you know this program that's on TV at the moment with Sean Bean and um, yeah. is it Stephen Graham Time. Yeah. Um, I think yeah. that's allowed people to see that actually uh, prison isn't a isn't a picnic even if you have got a, <laughs> if you have got a flat screen TV <laughs> no so t tell us what you, what the program consisted of then in in the way of treatment for for people yeah so we i suppose coming from a health background um had were much more interested in the impact that early childhood attachments have on people and i I'd, I'd actually worked in a prison before i trained as a clinical psychologist and met numerous people all of whom had had really horrendous upbringings and my experience was that abuse and neglect was pretty much the norm for the men the men and boys that I was coming into contact with um, and that's my experience in hospitals also of treating men and women who've committed offences so coming into the unit um, for me it felt really important that the first half of treatment was focused on helping them heal from their own trauma so it's like how can you how can you really appreciate the impact that you have on others if you're not really emotionally connected to yourself and find it really difficult to identify what you feel, um, struggle to form relationships with others and struggle to have empathy for other people. So the first two and a half years of treatment was really spent focusing on helping them heal from what had happened to them. And then the, sh the balance would shift for the last half of treatment, which was then focused on um, making reparation for what they'd done themselves and so the treatment was five years long they have individual therapy throughout that that period um, and they were allocated to a group and because we had a mixed population of men who'd committed violent offences and men who'd committed sexually violent offences they were in groups together working alongside each other knowing each other's offences which is really quite unique within the prison system. Grendon do manage that a bit, but I think it was quite, you know, we had a population of loners with quite extreme behaviour, um, working together in groups, and they would stay in that same group for every other element of the treatment programme. So um, we also um, taught the staff, as well as the prisoners, a schema-focused therapy model to help them understand how early childhood attachments influence the ways that we think about the world and what we expect from others okay well we, we ought really to get an idea of what that means like what's a therapy session like if it's schema focused and you're trying to heal these early childhood experiences in somebody who may be 50 years old and therefore well ingrained with a pattern of thinking and behaving how do you how do you even start 
Well, it's, that's, a, that's a really good question because these were people who were very resistant to building up relationships. You know, they, I think as mental health professionals, we often assume that because we, our intention is good, we expect to be experienced mm. in that way. And far from it, if the people who, loved, who should have loved you and cared for you during childhood were cruel to you, abused you and humiliated you, why would these paid people treat you any better so i would say the first 12 months of therapy is really spent just building up a relationship and actually uh, therapists being extremely robust and tolerating an awful lot of rejection from from these men quite a lot of verbal abuse um and but i think there was a the way that we act so for instance people would have a session 50 minute session which would happen at the same time every week and if the individual didn't turn up for the therapy session the therapist would sit in the room anyway and the therapy rooms are converted prison cells on the landing above where the prisoners live so the prisoner could see that you were going into the into the therapy room to do a session and so actually if the prisoner wasn't coming up then some of his peers would get quite hacked off with him like you're wasting you're wasting her time um i could have had that extra extra time um but also it communicates that they're worth they're worthy of that so a lot of the rejection is about people feeling they're not good enough they don't deserve how could you possibly care about them or want to give them something positive and yet if you're sat there week in week out and they're not coming they see that actually they must matter in some way so when they so when they come into the cell in quite a short space of time yeah when they, when they eventually come into the room to join you and they say something like why don't you just fuck off or you know um yeah. what are you doing here it's a complete waste of my time you know how how do you then respond to that because the 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 natural response is to bridle it you know aggression and you know somebody being hostile to you that's a kind of human response if somebody's you know the first opening sentence is why don't you just fuck off you know what do you know about anything? How do you deal with that? How do you then react in this kind of situation? You're absolutely right, George. That's that. That's human behaviour. And I suppose what's standard in prison, if someone says fuck off, is the response they're met with. No, don't you tell me to fuck off. You, you fuck off. <laughs> um, but actually, our, our response, and that's, and that's kind of, it shouldn't really be, but I'd say that that's quite acceptable in prison to behave in that kind of angry, angry way back, even as a mm. staff member. Our response would be to say, it's totally understandable that you feel like that, you know, you've you've had experience of people not wanting to spend time with you, um, but, you know, just to know that you, you deserve this session and I really want to build up a relationship to work with you. If um, somebody was telling you to fuck off much further on in treatment, we would also talk about things like feeling quite hurt. You know, you've you've spent ages building up this relationship. So when therapists go on holiday, it's quite common for the person who is receiving therapy to get hacked off that their therapist isn't there and to ask for a ch change of therapist or to not come the weeks after the therapist has returned from holiday, <laughs> kind of like as an angry protest. And we would talk about the fact that's quite hurtful that we've invested in this relationship with them and actually they're acting in this way. And to be honest, they're always, they're always quite shocked by that because they don't really believe they impact on other people. Um, they don't believe they matter. So how could you possibly care if they've not bothered to turn, turn up for the session? I think a lot of what therapy is doing in the fence is throwing people a curved ball. So yes, people do normally behave in the predictable way of um, you know, becoming aggressive or trying to create one-upmanship back. But actually, if you know what's happening intellectually, you know that, that you know, we teach staff that this is what's going to happen. This officers as well, we teach them that this is how um, the prisoners will behave when they first come because they're not expecting kindness. They expect that if they push you, that you'll become abusive back to them. Um, and actually have get staff thinking much more honestly about what's going on for them. So talking about things like feeling hurt or frightened is another thing that we would speak about with prisoners. You know, if a prisoner's shouting aggressively at you, we would, we might say you're behaving in a way that's really frightening uh, right now. But, and again, in the prison system, that's really, really unusual. People don't want to give that. They feel like they're giving power over to the, yeah. to the prisoner, whereas we would say that that's really important to be emotionally authentic and honest. Mm. 
That does that stand, you know does that shock them when they hear those words you know you are frightening me. Yes, and I think sometimes they're not actually even intending to. Sometimes they are intending to be frightening, but a lot of the time they're not actually. They're just they're becoming more and more emotionally aroused, and that's why they're that's why they're shouting. Mm. But they do they do find it um, strange, and I th- I think staff come into the unit always find it really strange as well. So we always ask people at interview. Uh, could you tell a prisoner if they were behaving the way that was frightening and they'll say well I'd say I was a bit anxious but there's this real anxiety about being being so vulnerable actually in terms of saying I feel quite frightened by how you're how you're Mm. behaving right now but it's so powerful and when when the unit first opened it was fairly common for men to get taken to the segregation unit and you'd have a big team of staff wearing riot gear so the crash helmets yeah um, shields, the, the batons, and all the rest of it, and they would say, "We're not frightened." And it's like, <laughs> "You're not frightened? Why are you dressed like that then?" Um, <laughs> and, and, th- and that happened for like the first couple of years, but but after that, th- that stopped because staff got much more skilled at having managing conversations. So you could say to the prisoner, "You're going to the segregation unit right now um, because you've behaved in a way that's that's actually really frightening." And the problem, of course, when you open a cell door and you're looking at loads of men and women in armour, effectively, is that even though the prisoners go into segregation because they've behaved aggressively, they then start feeling like the victim because, of course, they feel overwhelmed by um, this big team that have come all kitted up to remove them. Mm -hmm. And so they go down to segregation feeling like a victim, even though the reason they're going is because they've behaved aggressively. Whereas if the staff members are opening the door and there's just kind of like three individuals dressed in normal normal clothing saying right we've come to take you down to segregation because actually you're behaving in a way that's frightening us right now that keeps the the yeah. the the person who's the perpetrator continues to be the prisoner that's being taken down and they have to then take responsibility for their actions whereas that all goes out mm. the window when they've been removed in by a kitted team and of course a kitted team the aggression that's implicit there is like familiar to most of these guys because that's the life they've lived in which you know aggressions responded to with aggression and and self-regulation of your emotions is what you're actually modeling for people that is that as mature adults you're able to show that you can be upset but you can regulate yourselves and manage your behavior in spite of how upset you may have been by the aggression or the threats or whatever it is so they presumably have a year of experience of you modeling how do you regulate your emotions and they perhaps can learn how to do some of that in the course of time Uh, yeah absolutely i think you know the Therapists, and I have to say the prison officers are absolutely exceptional really, because it's really good, I think, to have strong male role models around also mm. being able to talk about their mm. emotions in a, an emotionally authentic way. I've worked with some amazing officers. Um, but I think all of that, the, the environment and being repeatedly exposed to people are much more emotionally authentic than you would normally get in prison is absolutely essential to people beginning to question the way that they've been and beginning to start being less frightened of emotion. And I think, you know, there's a lot of um, discussion about research into people who are identified as psychopathic, not showing fear. My experience is that they don't show fear when they're met with aggression, because as you've just said, George, they're very used to aggression. They've got ways to deal with the aggression. They know they can manage that situation. They're actually much more frightened of intimacy and emotional intimacy. And Mm. actually, if you're kind to them, that's much more scary um, (laughs) because Mm. they don't know what's going to happen because they're not used to it. Yeah. 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 So you're using your personality really as a therapeutic tool. You become... The therapy, your personality, and the way you express and interact, is is a large part of the. That's it's not. Great, it's not a protocol of tricks and it. tips that you you use. It's actually using yourself, and uh, how you communicate, as the therapy. That's that's yeah. such a great way of putting it. Absolutely, mm. and I th- I think that also. Sh- 
shows why it's not for everybody not everybody can do it because not everyone mm. is prepared it takes quite a lot of courage mm. and bravery to mm. be able to connect with your own vulnerability in that environment with people who can be dangerous and be willing to stick your neck out and have some of the conversations that people have so you know amazing staff group that are, that are able to do that but not everybody can it's not for everybody what what's i mean obviously people react differently um and there's no set answer obviously naomi but what is it a benefit do you think um to be a woman in that environment doing the therapy yeah i think i think you're right jill i think there are some men who for whatever reason i think that men can find it easier to open their vulnerability up to women on occasion but also you know on the opposite side of that when certainly when the unit first opened i would say probably two-thirds of them are seriously offended against women so there was a lot yeah. of hate against women and mm. um certainly you know i'd I had to put it you know I've been called all sorts of all sorts of things you can't have a thin skin in the time working in there but I've been called um you know people would spread rumors that I'd been sacked from a previous job for being in porn films you know so really quite hateful <laughs> when because obviously we have a lot more women in the service and I remember in my very fair wife not to have to put up with women um telling us what to do in this environment mm. um you know so the the cultural shift in terms of creating more respect and the, you know it was it was difficult for male staff that are used to working in an environment where there's a lot of kind of like dominant male dominance and mm. actually a lot of the clinical staff are fe- more more of the f- uh, clinical staff are female and especially the senior senior ones but the other thing i guess in terms of the men and what the men bring to to the unit in terms of their history is they've all experienced abuse from at the hands of both men and women but often their mothers have been there more present in their lives even though they've often been very abusive and when we looked at the figures who of the 66 percent of the population that had been sexually abused on multiple occasions generally and of the 66 percent that had been sexually abused at least 52 percent of them had been abused by at least one woman during that period so i think there can be a tendency to assume that women are experienced as nourishing and nurturing and kinder and softer but actually that was that wasn't the experience for the men in the service so some of them are way more frightened of women than they were of than they were of men um, did you so it'd all be quite individual but did you have a figure for exactly. whether the, the, the woman had been their mother what did you know what proportion of, of that would be a mother who had sexually abused their child I can't tell you off the top of my head, but the the, the women who'd sexually abused were, were and they, they weren't doing it with men, they were doing it on their own. So mothers, aunts, sisters, babysitters, all the same sorts of people, right. you know, if, if the gender were reversed in terms of thinking about men. And quite often that abuse by women played a significant role and you could see how that fed into their thinking mm. around their index offence and why they were emotionally triggered. And I suppose many of the men that come to our service would have stamped on their file not to be left alone with a woman because of their, they were seen as being more dangerous to women. We would typically give that person a female therapist. So if someone had, if someone's index offence was mainly focused on a woman, so if they committed rape of a woman, for instance, they wouldn't have a male therapist, they'd have a female therapist. Um, you rotten we lot. Would see that <laughs> actually... <laughs> You're doing, well, always doing the opposite you know, the of what's would... expected. <laughs> but I think that's what's so important and been what's yeah, effective. Sure. So, yeah. for instance, there was one man whose mother had had been horrendously abusive, and he'd he'd killed his wife. And but he was his behaviour around male staff was you know couldn't be more helpful, really obliging, um, really pleasant. But actually, quite often fell out with female staff and then wouldn't talk to them. And so symbolically, what he was doing was recreating his index mm. events all mm. over again. Now, if he'd been given a male therapist, he would have yeah. looked as if he was you know doing quite well yeah. and being quite stable. But actually, yeah. he needed that relationship with a woman to to demonstrate his. Um, you know the issues that he had so the it's it's not that's not the norm for prison but actually it's it, it i think it's effective and the so we the 
the therapy as a rule doesn't have an officer inside but there would be up to three therapy sessions going on there are panels in the window and there'd be an officer outside patrolling who could see in um, and see if there was anything happening and if anyone was at risk if their relationship broke down and somebody was becoming very aggressive towards their therapist which isn't that unusual um, then we would have an officer in the session but it, that would be the aim would be for that to be for as short a period as possible mm. and some of the men actually needed an office their personal officer in the session during the first 12 months of therapy because they were so frightened of the therapist so if they were coming up each week and being very aggressive and very abusive we would see to me that's a frightened man you don't need to be aggressive unless you're frightened and the man that's coming in very, being very abusive to his therapist we would we would formulate that around fear usually and so they would have their personal officer in the session in order to feel that they'd got a buddy someone to ally with them someone that was going to protect them from the therapist and stop the therapist from being abusive or tearing strips off them humiliating them and again the aim would be to try and get that person out of the session as soon as possible because there's less intimacy if you have three people yeah. in the room yeah. um, but it, you know that can make a big difference to whether people could manage to be in therapy that's wonderful because you turn their world completely upside down don't you that um, it, you know, it can appear that the, the officer's there to protect the therapist and then you reframe it completely and it's a different world that they find themselves in, not the one that they've spent the last 50 years living in. Um, it's a shock. Absolutely. It's a shock for them. Yes. Yeah. Ab absolutely. And, and do, you, do you remember there was that research that was kind of like people's personalities don't change, but I... Mm which obviously now we know that that's that, that that isn't actually accurate but i think part of that is about people need to have a different emotional experience and if you're mm. behaving in the same way and getting the same response all the time you don't get any evidence to, yeah. to suggest that there might be other ways of functioning that could be safer or give you more quality in your in your life and i think by trying to give people these different experiences um in very small ways but those small ways are actually really significant yeah. to, to but, the individuals but you have got you, you you are dealing with people whose nervous system is pretty entrenched in a certain pattern of thinking certain neural pathways are well established and um, there are habits there which are comfortable and you know they're used to and you've only got a few years to try and change any of that and even that's in an artificial environment where the stimuli from outside the, the outside world simply aren't there anymore you know they're, they're quite protected even though they're being punished so so what what kind of progress could you see because it's difficult to make progress with with these problems very difficult it it is and and i think you know having that snapshot of what someone's like at the start of therapy is really important because actually change and progress is so slow and i think the other thing is although there was five years of treatment but i think that will be changing as a consequence of efficiency that and, and i think the, although there were five years of treatment the last year of course people have got their eye on the door and if treatment was too short people wouldn't build up relationships because they'd be fearful of well what's going to happen there's no point in me building you know there were men would say that even with five years of treatment i'm really frightened of building up a relationship with you because if i end up feeling mm. dependent on you or needing the relationship what's going to happen when i'm not here yeah. and, or you're not yeah. around yeah um but you could see that actually the um, individuals become really really attached to their therapists and um, that again is a challenge for the prison system because of course the prison system construes everything as being kind of romanticized or sexualized and and of course romantic and sexual feelings did emerge for some individuals why wouldn't it if you're They're bound to you're not exposed to to exactly you're not exposed to many women here's this woman being nice and kind to you of course but we would see that as being something to be worked through but I remember in the very early days one man wrote a poem to his therapist comparing her to a rose <laughs> and the prison staff wanted to take him to segregation and all he'd done is written a poem um you know appreciate be in appreciation of her and thankfully we were able to get them to see that that's just a normal part of treatment and the officers that worked on the unit were able became really good at managing those kind of conversations and being able to have conversations with the prisoners about their the feelings for therapists without becoming too startled or frightened but I would say the vast majority of 
of prisoners ended up feel I would say felt quite loved in the sense of agape you know loving compassion felt loved by their therapists and that's what they invested in the relationship themselves so they weren't talking about it in a romantic or sexualized way they were talking about it in um in a really deep emotionally mature way and in the group therapy the first 12 months at least were horrendous of doing groups because you've got eight men who <laughs> identify as loners don't want to be in a room with each other if they don't trust you as a therapist they certainly don't trust the other men that are in the room and they would often try and negotiate and bond together by attacking the therapists um, as a way right. of creating safety but by year three in therapy they would be talking about this is the first time in my life i've ever felt loved and cared for and be really expressing a lot of compassion and care for one another be crying in front of one another and be receiving appropriate really healthy um, expressions of support um, so actually you can see massive significant changes and even though many of the men would be going so, you know if they weren't off cat a at the end of treatment they would be going to another high secure prison some men would get off K A, but they no sorry they get off what category, get off category a either category a yeah. said, you get said. Off category a so that's right. a yeah that's a risk rating right, um, right. but considering they had come mainly from segregation which is extremely expensive and they're isolated and have very poor quality of life because they're mm. not able to interact easily with others and they would go from us into perhaps another therapeutic service or another treatment program or be living on a normal location actually their quality of life improved significantly and i think because we made the men feel safe and cared for they didn't need to behave they we have very low levels of aggression and violence within the unit compared to a normal high secure prison wing and i think as a consequence people forget the histories of these men so they would come round and they would see you know somebody happily interacting with others they'd forget that he'd previously taken hostages in prison and been seen as being extremely dangerous because what they see is this man who's actually functioning and playing a healthy part within a community of people and in some ways that can be our downfall because that can make it look like the work's really easy when actually it's it's taken a lot of hard work to get somebody into that place of feeling safe and contained Mm. And can it be transposed into another setting or does it, I mean, how, how does that go? Because moving somewhere else means that the culture doesn't come with them. They have to somehow survive or are you able to follow them up in some way to keep them um, thinking straight? Well, I, th I think for it's a good question and I think for us, the good next step was always going to be a therapeutic community because mm. there again there's the emphasis on relational ways of working building relationships and encouraging prisoners to have good relationships with each other and managing dynamics around fear and dangerousness by having open discussions um but in 2010 um they developed a whole network of services which were called the offenders with personality disorder network and that was designed to create um, places that men from us and Westgate could pass on to within the prison system so that there would be a lot more services some of those are the therapeutic communities were absorbed into that as well as well as us but also there were other services set up some of which were known as pipe units so psychologically informed uh, planned environment and these pipe units didn't offer treatment but what they did do was try and recruit prison officers that wanted to um, focus on interacting relationally and would try and have more activities available would try and foster more of a sense of community in those spaces and so they've always been good places for prisoners from our service to go to but of course we're talking about that's not the majority of beds in prison so it's a small proportion of people that get onto the the pathway and to get into category a you have to be quite severely dysfunctional I mean that's quite an extreme end but there must be quite a substantial population in the rest of the prison estate men in, let's talk about men in particular who who also have very damaged backgrounds and whose behavior can be linked to their background they're not simply you know successful criminals who are well organized who happen to have been caught they're people who've messed up repeatedly probably and 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 that originates in childhood experience but there are they is is there any way in which they can get access to anything like this 
this great mass of okay. you know of men again that's a that's that's a really good question and I ha you know I've worked in a cat B prison um setting up a mental health in reach team in, in Leeds the first that was the first one in the country and I've also done community forensic and when I I worked as a prison psychologist as I said before a clinical psychologist working in um, a cat D prison um, as well as a cat C prison and a young offenders and my experience is everyone I've ever encountered in prison has this kind of history some people are more dangerous and some people's histories have been more have had more brutality in them and I would say in our service quite often the men have felt their parents hated them and wanted them dead uh, which is quite an extreme childhood experience um, but to actually abuse could say that. a history of abuse mm. is rife mm. yeah um, so an awful lot of our men are cat a but we we've also had you know men who are cat b prisoners and when we first opened because there was no service like ours that was offering a trauma focused service we also took some um, people who were on indeterminate public protection sentences um, but the pr the prison service has a big initiative at the moment of trying to be trauma informed but i suppose i would say that being trauma informed ultimately at its most basic is about making people feel safe and unless you can really get to grips with how do you make people feel safe in prisons then mm. you know really that that's that's the work but what you hear in publicity is the opposite that prison is not safe um not not least because of the criminality that's going on in the prison itself and the the, the way in which cultures can take a grip whether it's uh, whether it's racist or whether it's drug induced or drug drug based or 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 what you know um it doesn't sound as though prisons are safe at all yeah i'd say i think that that's most people's experience of prison as i would say. Mm. and you know the men from our service would say they were really frightened about going back to other parts of the prison system because they would have to put their armour back on and find different mm. ways of relating. Mm. And we do do post treatment visits um, about six months after they've they've left us. And mostly they have gone to, like I say, they've gone to therapeutic communities or other OPDP services. Um, so they've they've been able to re retain that way of being and mm. that would be their hope would be to transition out or to have spent so many years consolidating a different way of being um, but I don't think that's feasible for everybody and I suppose because the prison service is creaking at the seams in terms of um, you know the number of people that are in prison and being able to have these kind of like conversations with people that actually really matter um you know if you've only got one officer but lots and lots of people they don't have the time to, to you know there isn't the staff to be able to have those kind of meaningful purposeful interactions and this is a, a very different thing from the um anti-terrorism um programs isn't it i mean you're talking i mean you're we're thinking about fishmongers hall and the mistakes made about risk assessment and people being able to game the system and deceive the uh, authorities um, and, and the anxiety behind that about how on earth do you manage that, how on earth do you um, minimise the risks and release people um, so that they're safe. This is a completely different group of people isn't it? Presumably you don't have any overlap with, with the others. No, it's co it's completely different. We do have people who've got engaged in, um, flirted with extremism, I would say, mm. um, from both alt-right as well as um, uh, Islamic fundamentalism. But that's not that's not our normal population. And actually, ultimately, I think when people are radicalised and seeking out these groups, it's often about craving belonging. And right. actually, the men in our service are, are enabled to develop the sense that they belong and they matter um, in other ways. So actually, those any ex expressions of kind of like more extremist views quickly dissipate um, when they're in with us. The men in our service are not because we're an expensive resource. We take people who. Are, are not going to easily get out of prison if somebody's going to get out of prison quickly um then we, we wouldn't 
yeah. they wouldn't be seen as being a high priority for us. We, we only take mm. them if they've got nowhere else that they can go for treatment. And there has been investment in creating services for people who are radicalised in, what, in whatever way. So they wouldn't ordinarily be coming to us, no. And you're in a, you're in a high risk um, niche of work, really. I mean, you're, you're turning the world upside down for this group of prisoners and confronting them with a different kind of environment from what they're used to, a different, a completely different emotional environment. And you're relying on the prison staff to cooperate with that so that the, because otherwise you can't do your work. And, uh, and that's, a, that's a high risk situation in any organization, which is, which is really based on punishment and containment and um, you know, responding to the public appetite for getting people off the streets and perhaps punish, just punishing them. So um, how does this, how, is there a problem surviving within, within the institution? Um, or do you find, is, is it risky for you? Do you know that is such a fantastic question and in fact I'm doing some research with some individuals um, at Nottingham Trent University at the moment because it's it's very well known that services for people identified as personality disordered tend to have a shelf life um, because I think they're an irritant to their host institution quite often because they highlight the deficits in policies. Yeah. So the kind of policies that work within an, an institution on the majority, majority of the population don't work for this, this client group. That's why they're a problem to the system because their policies weren't, weren't working already. So you have to do things differently and doing things differently often um, jars against mm. the institution. So it's not unusual for services to fall. I mean, I'm amazed that Grendon has stayed open for 60 years next <laughs> next year, but I, I think that's because Grendon is an institu a total institution in its own right. So although it's in the prison service, it is an institution in its own right. But if you look at other examples of services like, like the service that I work for, um, whether they be in the health sector or the criminal justice system, they only really last about 20 years. And even though they might be really well appreciated and well valued by the people who, who benefit from those services, they're seen throughout the country as being a, a beacon of good good practice, but they typically get gobbled up by their... And so, for instance, places like the Henderson Hospital, mm. um, the Max Glatt Unit, um, Barlinia, I mean, there were some some problems there, but I th I think ultimately an awful lot of what happened there was was good and perhaps could have been shaped up and tweaked, uh, but these services don't generally survive. So of course it is quite it is quite worrying, and it's uh, you know it was our twenty year anniversary um, last year, so and of course when these services start, there's a big investment because people recognise there's a problem with this population. Something needs to be done. A huge amount of money is invested in creating um, new services and then of course as I said I think we can make the work look too easy and people forget that there would be a problem if, if the service wasn't there and so then they decide that the service can close and they've got other ways to deal with it and I think you end up on this roller coaster of building services they collapse or get demolished and then they have the whole thing starts all over again and mm. we did a podcast recently with Chris Scanlon who worked at the Henderson Hospital which was really fascinating hearing him talk I need to and I need to interrupt you actually Henderson being I need to interrupt you because Sorry, the yes. Henderson Hospital and the Grendon Underwood are therapeutic communities Grendon Underwood yep. within the prison system Henderson Hospital in the NHS and they run yep. on the basis that the that, that it's for treatment of people with personality problems or you know troubled backgrounds which causes their behavior to be dysfunctional or problem behavior and it runs on the basis that people yeah. share the experience as you've been experienced as you're describing in your unit um people are, are having to um the, both the staff and the and the residents the patients or prisoners whichever it is are having to um uh, confront their emotional behavior on and, and it has to run in a particular way in order to function in that way. So there, there are particular kinds of units called therapeutic communities, aren't they? So I'm sorry to interrupt you. Um, that's but, right. But, but I guess... No, no, absolutely, that's useful. There's a, there's, a, there's a historical precedent for why you get killed off. 
which is worrying. I mean, I'm going to step into a, a storm of problems by saying that, of course, you know, this is this is Jesus's story, isn't it? That is, you you you're you're <laughs> successful, but in the end, you have to be crucified because the uh, the powers that be find it difficult to contain what you're what you've created, and and I suppose that would be my worry working in that field is that you. Uh, you, you're, you're nudging against what's intolerable to the institution. Absolutely, and I think, you know, what's significant is I think these services are often characterised by kindness, compassion, mm. um, the, you know, as I said, you know, um, a sense of love and safety. And actually, that jars against what the prison, how the prison system is often represented and depicted. You know, as harsh, brutal, um, mm. punitive, mm. and certainly there is a desire, I think, from a big section of society for prison to be that. Mm. So it then becomes quite hard to do something different. And certainly, the officers in our service even still get mopped by officers in other parts of the prison system mm. and derided for being care bears mm. um, oh dear. And, and people see it as being kind of like soft work mm. and as if it's easy work it's not as good um uh, but actually when this it's interesting because staff that have had the attitude before when they come and work in our service then they're like actually this is the most most, this is the hardest I've ever worked during my career because mm. it takes a lot of skill and stamina to be able to have the kind of tough conversations that and you have, have to have throw your personality into it your your, your personality is involved yes. as you were saying before which is very intrusive yeah. on your own private um, emotional experience yes Naomi I, I'd love to know if you if you absolutely have, have us have a think about this I don't know if you've ever been asked it but Think of all the men that you've helped and look at, look at them from the perspective of when they were children, the experiences that they had as children. Were they in the main um, taken into care or were they left with their parents? Were they not known to social services? I, well, I know when we did an audit that 27% of them were taken into care. So there will obviously be some as well who were known to social services but weren't removed. But we know that twenty seven percent were were removed from their families. But seventy you're, something percent weren't. And you're you're talking about. I mean, yeah, it sounds exactly. From, it sounds from what you're saying that these children who are treated by their parents as unloved, as not wanted, as better if it, if they were dead, could well have been at home, lived at home with their parents for their childhoods. It sounds like a, a good proportion of them, Bigger. Without, the majority, uh, without without social services and intervention. Absolutely, yes, the majority. And those those are the people that yeah, end the up the majority. You know, they're the people that end up in your service who have been. You, you present the greatest risk to others. They've done the worst things that you can do to other people, and yet they haven't seemingly been seen in education in social services as requiring protection from the care that they're having from their parents or lack of care that they're having from their parents absolutely many of them talk about kind of like frequently running away from home or sleeping on the streets for not for a few nights to get some you know if dad was coming home in a violent angry temper that they would would take themselves out of the home while dad calmed down um it's typical for them to describe parents who've got problems with alcohol or other substances um i think what's really interesting is when when the men come to our service they've already been seen by lots of psychologists psychiatrists probation officers and actually what we discover about their histories is significantly statistically significantly different later and uh, you know i've seen in reports descriptions like you know he was raised within a normal working class family but actually the normal working class family involved mum and dad separating and both moving their new sexual partners into the same family home along with the respective children so they were kind of like six children and two four adults living in a very small house well that's not a normal working class family that says more about the the prejudice of the person who wrote the report or you know it's grotesque. hearing descriptions like i was he had a 
exactly a normal a normal afro-caribbean upbringing because the child was beaten regularly at home and that was seen as being normal for a, for a black family so the, the, you know these reports obviously you would hope that things have changed over time and this is an older population um but yeah a lot of a lot of trauma that just wasn't responded to and if you look at joe public's response to say um the boys that killed Jamie Bulger or other kind of like crimes of, you know, very young prepubescent boys, they're treated like monsters by the media and encourage us, you know, thinking about people in this way rather than thinking these are actually really disturbed, hurt, damaged children that need the opportunity to heal and need some intervention. You know, it's, we're quick, I think, to expel them from school and marginalise them and tell them they don't belong in society. And people that don't think they belong then don't feel like the rules of society apply to them because why would they? They're, nobody cares about them, so why should they care about what society wants them to do? Mm. I, I think the population might also think, actually, you know, that it's the children who have who are in care who present so badly in in you know in the future as it were that the, the the poor care service produces a lot of these kind of adults and i'm sure it does but isn't it a surprise i i think it's a tremendous surprise to think that i think the population would think that there are far too many children being taken into care i i often read that you know far too many care applications are being made and then i hear from you that you know, the vast yes. majority of the men. But the research right. that's been done actually shows that taking children into care, although it's not perfect and there's lots of harm done, is better than the experience they would have had if they're left to their families. I mean, that is the actual research evidence, even though the, fa the care system yeah. fails uh, in, in many ways. Mm. Not intervening is an even bigger failure. Um, but I think we have to finish on that tragic note, <laughs> Naomi. Um, and we need to thank you for giving us such a fantastic it's uh, been tremendous. interview and yeah. telling us about what's going on in, in a world which I don't think anybody really knows anything much about. Because um, we've uh, only touched the surface as well, haven't we, really? But um, been, it's been tremendous to hear what you know, Naomi. Thank you. Thank you. And thanks for inviting me on. It's been so great. So, you know, I'm really passionate about the, this mm. kind of work with people in prison because I think it's so badly needed. So it's been great to have the opportunity to talk about it. Much appreciated.